Last week, we began a whole new series with you, uh, really talking about this issue of law and grace. And regardless what your background is, whatever kind of church you came from, uh, you might not have used a dialogue about law and grace. Maybe the church you grew up in did use the terms about law and grace, but it kind of comes into this, this balance between doing right and doing wrong. And somehow we, we in our mind, are thinking that... that um, I'm supposed to be good even though I don't know the good I'm supposed to do. I mean, even if I don't know the rules, there's something inside of me that says I'm supposed to be nice to people. I should be nice to animals. I should be just nice. I'm just supposed to be a good person. And, and that, 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 that we all know that good people go to heaven and bad people go to non-heaven, right? Oh, so we kind of get the sense. And, and we hope somewhere within our, our walk in life that when, when God looks at our life and he takes this assessment at the end of it, somewhere along the line, that, that our, our good outweighed our bad and hopefully that was enough to get us in. We've kind of got a sense of that whole thing. Uh, but, but, but there's so much more to it than that. Maybe you grew up in a church where it was all law. The, the, the skirts had to be a certain length. You had to wear a skirt, but it had to be a certain length. Men, you had to wear a suit. No tattoos tattoos, no piercings. Um, the hair had to be a certain way. Man, your hair had to be perfect. Uh, maybe women, you, like the hair had to be like the beehive on top. I don't know, that whole thing. The reason that women used to make their hair really high on top is because that's the way churches were shaped. And they, anyway, so just whatever the case is, we, Whatever background you came from, and there was the law thing. There was just the law. And then, and then there's other people that decided, you know what, let's react to the law. It's all about rules, rules, rules. I think God just loves us based upon who we are. It's all about grace, grace. God just loves people. He just loves us. He just loves us. In fact, we can sing songs in church. Oh, how he loves me. He just loves me, loves me, loves me. He just loves me. He just loves me. We just love those warm fuzzies. There's got to be a balance to it somewhere. And so we talked about grace last week. We talked about grace. And what we discovered about grace is that, that nothing will propel us or move us towards grace faster than the feeling of guilt. That when we feel this sense of guilt, there's something inside of me that's wrong and I got to get it right. Oh God, please, when you look at my life, when you look at my life, please find some right, some good inside of me so that I, I can feel forgiven and know that I'm forgiven. And we learned about grace last week, that grace costs everything for the giver, but it costs nothing for the recipient. When Jesus hung on the cross, Jesus gave everything that he had. God the Father put his one and only son on the cross, and he hung there for us. And Jesus hung on that cross, giving his whole life for you and me. And what did we have to give in return? We have nothing. We have nothing but our self-will to surrender to Jesus Christ. That's all that we have. And so that's what we learned. We, we have the sense inside of all of us, though, that, that God has all of these rules and all of these commands. And why do there have to be so many rules? And I think God is standing there with a big stick. And if I mess up, if I mess up, oh, if I mess up in one of those rules, he's going to smack me right on the head with that stick. And that's one mark against me. Now, now I've got to do some more good to counterbalance the bad that I've done. And so our life becomes this constant tension of hoping that the good we do outweighs the bad so that we can earn Earn God's love because that's the way we grow up in the world that we live in, that good people get ahead in life and bad people don't. And so we understand there's a set of rules, a set of laws. We talk about the Ten Commandments. You drive around town, maybe into our parking lot, you see the Ten Commandments. We're going to talk about those Ten Commandments for a little bit because last week we talked about grace. And you all walked out of here feeling so good about yourselves. Not today. <laughs> And here's what I've learned about the Ten Commandments from some very wise people that surround me. That the Ten Commandments reveal the character of God and they reveal the values of God. When you read the Ten Commandments, it quickly becomes evident that you know what God values? His relationship with His creation so that you and I can have life and the relationship that we have between one another. That the Ten Commandments, Jesus boiled them down to just two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. The second one has equal value, as much concern to love each other like you love yourself. That's, that's what it comes down to. And So God had these Ten Commandments and it reveals His value and what's important to Him. And it also reveals my rebellion. Whenever there's a rule, it reveals my rebellion and it reveals my need for grace. I don't know about you, but I know if there's rebellion in me by how I feel and respond when somebody tells me I need to change something. Kind of my mantra lately is you can tell if a person's teachable by the attitude they have when they're being taught. 
when you read through the Ten Commandments, you have to look at yourself and nobody else. So we're going to look at the Ten Commandments. If you want to follow along in your Bible, however you get there today, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. It's the second book found in the Old Testament part of your Bible. So if you start at the beginning, you'll find Exodus. We're going to go to 20, and then we're going to start at verse number 1. Let me give you a little background of where we're at here. Moses. Moses is this man who has been ordained to deliver the nation of Israel from the land of Egypt. This took place thousands of years ago. Moses redeems them. He is God's man man of power for the hour, and he leads the nation of Israel out of the nation of Egypt. They get out into the wilderness, and God miraculously parts the sea that they can walk across on dry ground. He gives them shoes that don't wear out. He gives them clothes that don't wear out. He gives them food from heaven called manna. He provides for them water from a rock. He gives to them miracle meat that falls down out of the sky. God supplies their needs. He loves them, and he establishes relationship with them. And then, and then he says to Moses, come up on the mountain. I want you to come up on the mountain and I want to talk to you because we've got some guidelines to live by. There are some standards and I want you to bring these to my people. So for 40 days, Moses goes up on this mountain and he brings back, he brings back two stone tablets and on them contains the commandments of God. Now, just a little sideline. Uh, we, we know that this story is true because we've watched it on TV at Easter time with Charlton Heston. Are you with me? The Ten Commandments. We see it. So we know this is true. Anyway, I'm just being facetious here, but here's the funny thing to me. When I watch Charlton Heston come down, let my people go, that whole thing, and he comes down, and he's got two stone tablets. You've seen it, haven't you? And on one stone tablet, if you haven't seen it on TV, you've seen it somewhere. On one stone tablet is carved Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You've seen that, right? And on the other one, it's 6 through 10. The Roman Empire didn't even exist. There was no room in numerals. But he comes down with, and it's like, it's almost like God had to make two tablets because he writes so big, we got to have two. I don't think that's why. I don't think that's why. I think, I think when God gave the Ten Commandments, just opinion, Pastor Andrew, you're preaching at three o'clock today. You can correct me in your sermon if you want to. I think God made two copies. I think he made two copies, one for himself and one for us. God didn't run out of room when he wrote the Ten Commandments and have to have two tablets. I think God could have wrote it on little tiny square piece if he wanted to. All right? But we got the Ten Commandments. And so Moses comes down with these stone tablets. And in Exodus chapter 20, this is how the story goes. In verse number one, God gave all the people these instructions. And here they are. You ready? Verse number two. I am the Lord your God who, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. I love this. Before I give you the rules, let me just remind you who I am. Do you remember what you've just been doing for the last 430 years? You've been making bricks. You've been building pyramids. You've been making bricks and you've been building pyramids. You've been slaves to the Egyptians. I redeemed you because I love you. Now let's talk about the rules, okay? And so that's where God begins in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse number three. You must have, you must not have any other gods besides me. Is God egotistical? God is God. Who are we to argue with God? God is simply saying, look, the source of life and hope and all that you need comes from no other than me. I'm the one who created you and made you. I am God. There's no other God beside me. Let's build on that thought a little bit more as we go on to verse number four. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind of image or anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. Verse number five, you must not bow down to them or worship them for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other God. Now, I know some people can read this and react to it and go, whoa, God's a little egotistical here, isn't he? A little self-centered. Well, he is God after all. But let me tell you what he means by being a jealous God, that he will not tolerate our affection for anybody else. It's because he loves us and he wants to protect us. And he knows that naturally when we step out from underneath the umbrella of his protection and we start serving our own gods and going our own way, he knows the consequences of those actions. And he says, look, I have a different perspective than you. I see your life. You only see where you're at right now. I can see that if you make this choice today where it's going to lead tomorrow, I can see the consequence. I want to protect you from that. So I'm jealous for you. Let me explain the term jealous for you. I am jealous for you. As a pastor, as Robin and I serve you as a church, uh, I don't 
let just any Johnny come lately step up here and stand in front of you and bring you the word because I love you and I care about you and I care about what somebody speaks into your spirit. So I'm very careful about who I let stand in this place because I'm jealous for you. I'm careful for you. I'm cautious for you. I don't want somebody to lead you astray. I don't want to have to get up here the next week and correct all the problems and mistakes somebody made the week before because I care about you. That's kind of what it means to be jealous for somebody, okay? And also I'm a control freak. That's so anyway, so... Mm -hmm. Now, verse number 5 goes on to say, now this this you might think cold and heartless, but listen to what God says in verse number 5. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children, in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Now this isn't God's judgment. It's just natural consequences for walking away from God. And some of you this morning, some of you this morning are living in a house or have grown up in a home where you saw this played out because there was abuse in the family. Somebody physically and sexually abused you because their parents did it to them and their parents did it to them. Your dad was an alcoholic probably because his dad was an alcoholic or his mom was an alcoholic and you start studying the life of grandma and grandpa and great grandma and grandpa, you start to understand and know that there was a lot that went on in the house. And because of their choices, there's consequences that have just followed it. Some people call it generational sin. It's just the natural consequences that take place when people walk away and reject God. That's just what happens. And you're experiencing it in your life, exactly where you live today. It's the consequences of sin. Let me tell you something about sin, church. Sin is serious business. Let me just tell you this. Sin, and we're going to talk about sin this morning. Sin is serious business. We don't take sin seriously. We don't think about the consequences of sin. Oh, we know the Bible stories. We know the passages of scriptures that the wages of sin is death. But see, I'm a follower of Christ now, so it doesn't matter what I do anymore because I'm under grace. I can sin my brains out if I want to as long as I find the altar and ask God to forgive me of my sins. But I'm telling you, church, sin is serious business, and God takes it seriously, and he does not tolerate sin. He finds our actions, our attitudes, he finds our sin repulsive. They detest him. He is holy and righteous, and he will not tolerate the sin of humanity. Look around at the world today. God is repulsed by the sins of humanity. It's serious business, church, because the wages of sin is death. It's an eternal death. It's torment. It's apart from God. It is serious stuff, church, and you need to understand it. But we don't think about the seriousness or the consequences of sin because we don't see the immediate consequences of sin. We, we can sin a little bit, and nobody knew. <laughs> we can get by with it for a while, and nobody knows. But, 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 but remember, do you remember Pinocchio? Do you remember Pinocchio? What was Pinocchio's problem? He, he, he would tell a story. He would tell a lie. And when he told a lie, his nose would grow. Imagine if God wrote into the DNA of humanity the very same thing, that as soon as you told a lie... Whoop, you're, no, 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 I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it, I, I mean, let me, let me, no, no, I meant it this way. I mean, what if, what if our news, our nose just grews as soon as we, what if, what if when we gossiped, our tongue swelled up in our mouth, we had a hard time talking. What? No, I, I was just kidding, and it just stayed that way for a few hours afterwards. Oh, I've been gossiping, I see, mm, I mean, what if when we lusted after somebody, our eyes became like saucers in our head? We'd all be wearing sunglasses and closing our eyes, right? What if when we stole something, our fingers turned into bananas? Wouldn't that be awesome? Just huge things. You took it, didn't you? Mm, didn't do a thing. See? But since consequences of sin are not immediately seen or known or felt or, or, or the content, we, 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 we don't think they're serious. Sin is serious business, church. So, God talks about sin. <laughs> He's going to talk about us. And isn't it fun in church when you hear a really heavy message on sin? To think about somebody else's instead of your own. Because, let's just be honest, we live by the law. And you know what we love about the law? The law is black and white. And I can see that my life lines up with the law, but there's doesn't. 
And if you've ever had those thoughts or those feelings, well, let's see if maybe we have something in common as we read through God's commands. Verse number 7 says, uh, You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse His name. Have you ever uttered God's name and not been talking to Him or about Him? Verse number 8 says, Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We could preach a whole message on that one. Verse 12 says, Honor your father and mother. How many of you have ever dishonored your father and mother? And mom and dad, before you point this one out to your children, remember that you're someone else's child. <laughs> Verse 13 says, You must not murder. <laughs> Pastor, I got one right. I've never murdered anybody. Whew, finally, one of those commands I can do okay with. But, 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 but listen, in the New Testament, Jesus said, Hey, news for you. I didn't come to abolish this law. I came to fulfill it. And then Jesus said, hey, let me tell you something else. Let me tell you something else. If you have ever hated somebody in your heart, you've already committed murder. And if you have murdered somebody that makes you, then a murderer. <laughs> he says in verse 14 that you must not commit adultery. Pastor, I'm two for two. It's good. You're doing good. We're doing good. We're doing good. But Jesus said, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. And then Jesus said, if you've ever lusted after somebody, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And if you've committed adultery in your heart, that makes you an adulterer. Verse 15, you must not steal probably all stolen something. And if you steal something, you are now a thief. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. In other words, uh, don't lie. And if you lie, that makes you a, a liar. How am I doing so far? How are you doing so far? If I have this right, if I have this right, I am in church this morning, and if you're watching at home or watching online, uh, you're going to join right with me because we're all in the, the same boat together. Um, if I have my scriptures right, I am in church this morning with a bunch of murderous, adulterous, thieving liars. <laughs> and some of you want to live by the law. Okay, let's keep going. Um, verse 17, uh, God said, you must not covet your neighbor's house, wife, servant, ox, or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Doesn't it drive you nuts when your neighbor pulls into the parking lot or into the driveway with a new vehicle? Well, Moses gets to the end and says in verse number 18 that when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke that were billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. <laughs> the people had this visual aid as they stood at the bottom of the mountain. They saw God reveal to them His holiness, His power, His authority, and His righteousness. And He laid out the commands for them to live by. And they stood back, not as a slap-happy kind of a God. He's our buddy and He's our pal and He's my co-pilot. They didn't stand there and just say God is our number one fan. They didn't say God is for us. They didn't say, oh, how He loves me. They said, we can't take this because we're going to die if we listen to another word. In fact, the story goes on, the story goes on, they said it this way in the next verse in 19, they said to Moses, you speak for us and we will listen, but don't let God speak direct to, directly to us or we will die. I think as I read through Scripture, we get a misconception of who God is. I think of John, the guy who wrote the book of Revelation. John the Revelator is the same John who is at the Last Supper with Jesus, who said, I am the one that Jesus loved. The only thing that he could lay claim to in life was that Jesus loved him. And at the Last Supper, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he lays back a, 
against the breast of Jesus there at the supper table. Jesus is resurrected, and in his resurrected form, John sees him. John sees him, and when he saw the resurrected Jesus Christ in all his holiness, and his eyes did pierced right into his souls, he said, I fell as though dead before Jesus. He's not a slap-happy buddy. He is the righteousness of God. He is holy and true, and we will all bend a knee and bow before him because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is serious business, and God laid it out for us here. But we just kind of gloss over it because we know what to do with sin. Yeah. We know what to do with sin because some of us have grown up in the church, and if you're new to the church, listen, let, let, me, let me tell you how this works. We know how this works in the church. <laughs> We've got a system. Because, see, we learned some Bible verses. Uh, I think Psalm 103 says that, um, that as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, and he remembers them no more. So it's like every time we bring up our sin, God says, what sin? Uh, we know 1 John 1, 1.9 that says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. So we, we've got this down. We've got this down. We've got this down that we can go out, we can do whatever we want to because we live under the grace of God and God loves me despite what I do. He, he loves me no matter what I do. So we've got this down. I can go out and commit adultery. I can lie. I can steal. I can hate. I can murder. I can, I can dishonor my parents. I can go out and do whatever I want to as long as I get to church on Sunday morning, as long as I get to some place in my spiritual life where I say, God, I confess my sin to you. I sinned last night by doing blah, blah, blah. And then we've confessed it. And now since we've confessed it, God's forgotten about it. So the next time I do it, it's like it's the first time I've ever done it. And God is so clueless, but I know how to work the system. We just think we got this figured out. If you're new to the church, us church people, we, we know how this works. We just confess it, and it's gone like that. Yeah. Moses responded to the people. Verse number 20 he says, look, don't be afraid. Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you so that you will fear him and keep from sinning because sin is serious business. It separates us from God. It separates us from the author of our lives. It separates us from people that we love. We isolate ourselves in our sin and become vulnerable and weak. It destroys the fellowship between the author of life in our lives. And we know from Scripture that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. It's death. It's death. And here's what I know, church. You know what I know? If we're good at anything, if we're good at anything as humanity, you know what we're good at? We're good at breaking God's law. We're good at being a lawbreaker. We are vile and we are violent. We are filthy. We are like filthy rags, all of our righteous acts. This is what I know about us. We are good at rebelling against God. We're good at being vile. We're good at being unclean. We're good at being rebellious. We're good at being unjust. We're just good at being selfish. That's what we're good at. And in all of those actions, it just moves us away more and more from the author of our lives. I know that if I'm good at anything, I know that I'm good at sin. And a look at our world today would say, you know what? The whole world is good at sinning. The whole world is good at being selfish. The whole world is good at being vile and violent. The whole world is good at being filthy. Where in all of the humanity, where in all of the world and all that's taking place do we get squeamish about sin, about the sex slave industry where little children are chained to their beds and the place burns down and they're burned along with their bed? Where do we get squeamish about aborted fetuses by the thousands? Where do we get squeamish about about sin, church. Sin is serious business. And I know that humanity is good at sinning. And let me just tell you, church, and this is why God said we need something in plan. We need a plan. 
This is why God stepped into humanity and he said, we have to do something about this. In Genesis, he destroyed the whole earth with a flood. He destroyed all humanity and he said, I am grieved that I even made people look at their rebellion. He started all over again with a righteous man named Noah. Generations have passed and here we are on this day and he stepped into the middle of all of humanity and he said, we need an answer for this and he took Jesus and he put him on earth to live in our flesh, to live in our world and yet without sin and then he hung on that cross, sinless Jesus, and while he hung on the cross, God hung all of our sin on Jesus, and Jesus hung there and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God couldn't look on sin. He hung him on the cross, we hung our sins on him, and God turned his back, angry at sin. That's God. He hates sin. And if you want to live by the law, you better be able to keep the law. One day, all of us will stand. I don't know how this will take place. We talked about it at men's prayer breakfast yesterday. But all of us stand. All of us who call ourselves followers of Christ. Stand before Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.10. You can check it out for yourself. And we have to give an accounting for the things we've done in this body, whether good or evil. I hope it's a private event. And the things that we need to change before we get to that place, we can do it. And we do it through something called repentance. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we keep going. Yeah. And those who stand before the throne of God one day, unjustified, Sins unforgiven because of their continual rebellion. And let me just tell you something about the nature of God. As you read through Revelation, God goes to the nth degree many, many, many times to convince people to repent of their sins so that they won't die and suffer in torment in the burning lake of sulfur for all eternity. God does everything he can, but he doesn't violate people's will. And people will spend forever tormented, absent of the presence of God, and forever tormented. And if all of that seems cold and heartless, let me just tell you something about hell, eternal damnation, whatever you want to call it. Everybody who will ever end up there is there by choice. And if all of God's judgment seems hard to you and difficult to stomach, that's good, because then you can appreciate grace. You cannot appreciate grace until you understand that sin is serious business. And the incredible thing about God is that God started moving towards us with grace before we even knew that we needed it, before we even knew the definition of the word, because while we were still sinners, while we are still sinning our brains out, Jesus died for us on the cross incredible thing. And then, and, then, and then the Apostle Paul, this guy named Paul, speaks into this whole thing a little bit now with the good news. Let me balance it with the good news. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 18, here's what Paul says. Christ died for everyone. Guess who you are? You're in everyone. Hallelujah to God. Christ died for everybody so that those who receive his new life, those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Before I came to faith in Jesus Christ, I was living for nobody but me. It was all about me, how to please me, what I could get, how I could excel. Isn't that where humanity is? Isn't that what our culture promotes? It's all about the person. It's all about self-promotion. It's all about the individual. It's about what you want and what you can get and what you can have. And Jesus says there's got to come a time of reckoning when you understand that you need to die to yourself and start to live for Jesus Christ. And when you do that, he goes on to say, instead they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. What does all that mean? I'm glad you asked. He explains in verse number 17. This means that anybody who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new one has begun. Hallelujah. He goes on to say in verse 18, and all of this is a gift. It's a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Jesus Christ. We had wandered away Away like sheep straying away from the shepherd. We went rebellious to our own ways. And God said, I, 
don't want you to get into trouble. I love you too much. I want to rescue you. I'm sending you my son, Jesus Christ. He is my gift to you. Will you receive him? And then, and then the summation, really what he's meaning by all of that is in verse number 21. God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now let me balance this some more with some more good news for you. Remember how back in Exodus we talked about the penalty of rebellion to the third and fourth generation? I intentionally skipped over a verse. I want to bring it back to you right now. In Exodus chapter 20, verse number 6, but God says, I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Is it possible that you're here this morning because somebody that didn't even know you, you were the seed within a seed within a seed within a seed, but somebody came to repentance, somebody came to Jesus Christ a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, and they started praying for their offspring. And as a result of God's loving kindness and the faithfulness to his promise, you're enjoying the blessings of somebody's righteousness a thousand generations ago because God wants to redeem people because he doesn't like the thought of anybody dying apart from a relationship with him because he just loves us that much. But you can't understand the love of God until you know the consequences of our rebellion to God. People who have no grace like to live by the law because the law, the law is rules. We love the law because the law is black and white. There's clearly defined boundaries in the law. And if you want to live by the law, that's wonderful. Except here's what I've discovered only because I read about other people that our law lovers, you can't do it. It can be a guideline for you, but you can't keep the whole law. And James said, James, the half-brother of Jesus, if you break one commandment, guess what? You broke them all. So if you want to live by the law, you'll probably die by the law. And then, and then, and then on the other side of the whole thing, there's grace. The warm, fuzzy people. Oh, how he loves me. I'm rebellious. I am full of sin and I am vile and violent. And my sin is putrid in the nostrils of God. Oh, how he loves me. You can die by grace too. So we have to have a proper mix of law and grace, but you can't appreciate one until you understand the other. And let me, let, let me leave you with a thought before we end this morning. Let me leave you with a thought. I'll put it up here in the slide for you this morning. That You know what? The rules, the rules that we have, the rules, they reveal our rebellion. That's what rules do. They reveal our rebellion. But grace is revealed in our repentance. The currency, the currency of forgiveness is repentance. If you want forgiveness of sins, it doesn't come by just telling God, hey, I sinned. And I think, pastors, we've done a disservice to you by maybe leaving you with that impression. All I have to do is just confess my sin and my sin's gone. But the message that Jesus brought was you need to repent of your sin and repent means you just stop. That's what it means. You just stop. There needs to be an end to this. And as soon as I start to read through the Word of God, the Word of God becomes a mirror and I realize there's things I need to change. That's why people avoid reading the Word, because every time they read the Word, the Word starts to read them. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to see what we see in there, so we just avoid the Word of God. We don't like these feelings of conviction. We call it conviction in the church. It's guilt. And nothing motivates us towards the need or necessity for grace like the feeling of guilt. And I'm glad for guilt, because every time I feel guilt, it reminds me I'm stepping a little too close to the boundary of grace.